as you said, I will be talking about VQAs, which is joint work with uh, Sevak, who is still sitting up there, and uh, Martin, who has already left. Um, so for the outline of my talk, I will quickly motivate why um, people care about VQAs and um, also give the uh, relevant divisions for our complexity class. Um, then uh, we will, I will state our main results and finally uh, explain uh, how to prove our main theorem as well as give a particular example of a QAOA. Um, yes. So for the motivation, we all know that um, there exists quite a large uh, class of um, algorithms for quantum computers like Shor's algorithm or simulation as well as ground state estimation techniques. But those generally uh, require quite uh, deep circuits and uh, error correction. In contrast, if we think about near-term devices, they are uh, very noisy and uh, so far there isn't really a good proposal to make them scale. Um, this means effectively two things. This means that our implementations, when we do them, need to be uh, limited to a few qubits. And also we need to have really short circuits, since otherwise the noise component of our gates will start dominating and we just end up with white noise. So the uh, main question then is, um, can we use those near-term devices actually to perform anything which is practically, practically useful? And the answer to that is still uh, unanswered as far as I'm aware. But uh, one of the main pro uh, proposals to tackle this problem are uh, variational quantum algorithms, short VQAs. And the basic idea is uh, that we just use whatever resources we have available to prepare a variational state which is really close to the uh, crown state uh, energy of some uh, cost observable. This cost observable could be some combinatorical problem we're interested in, or it could be some like physically motivated Hamiltonian. Now, um, the way we prepare these variational states is by uh, effectively applying short quantum circuits and uh, crucially for VQAs, we also have these classical tunable parameters which we can think of as uh, how long we apply certain uh, gate sequences. So um, this kind of has the uh, promise that we can use quantum uh, classical optimization routines um, and uh, kind of up, uh, uh, measure the quantum device for a certain parameter regime and then use classical optimization to uh, minimize our cost function. Uh, and since classical resources are kind of cheap, this ideally would help us to t uh, get the most out of the quantum resources. So this is kind of the promise. Uh, but uh, like from the theory side, people have already uh, discovered some uh, quite important challenges. Uh, one is basically a measurement bottleneck that exists in this approach, uh, which leads to really long uh, run times. And the reason is basically that if we want to estimate an expectation value, uh, this is uh, prone to short noise errors. So um, every time we kind of have the classical algorithm called the quantum uh, algorithm, we do have uh, to perform many rounds of measurements which if we consider, for instance, that uh, trapped ions take on the order of seconds, this can already mean that the entire protocol will run really long. Uh, secondly, this problem is significantly amplified by a phenomena which has been described as barren plateaus, which is uh, a generic property of those effectively random circuits to have a vanishing unitary in these continuous uh, uh, variational parameters. Which of course means if we want to find the gradient, we do need to make even more measurements than we like, already can't really perform potentially. And then lastly, we also know uh, the complexity of those uh, uh, VQAs is uh, NP hard to optimize already if we are just looking at QDIT systems. So even if we don't have an exponential large Hilbert space. So um, one aspect one can look at here is that all of those three problems become easier if we uh, concentrate really on having short circuits. Because then kind of the barren plateau regime might not be reached and of course we can also run the algorithms faster. So uh, for our purpose, we are looking at it from a complexity side. So we actually have to define like a proper VQA instance, which we do here. I'll quickly go through the main points of this decision problem. So the input of a VQA is uh, 
an initial state, which we can assume to be the all zero state, then the cost observable we would be interested in, as well as uh, the set of gate generators. So um, we also, since we want to optimize the depth, we also uh, make the, uh, the structure be that we can effectively select the gate, pen, uh, uh, the gate uh, generators for every layer. So it doesn't have a fixed structure, but we can also reuse uh, the same generators multiple times. Um, and then this promise problem is now uh, describing a minimization problem both in the expectation value of our observable, but also in the uh, depths of the circuit we are running, uh, which we do by having two promise gaps uh, in the decision version, one with respect to the expectation value and one with respect to the circuit depth. So uh, quickly I will mention QCMA since it might not be that familiar to most. Um, it is a complexity class, which uh, is one of the many uh, quantum analogs of uh, the classical complexity class NP. And uh, the way one can think about it is it describes problems which we can verify with a classical proof on a quantum device. For reference NP, we have a classical proof on a classical device. So this is the aspect. Um, and then there's a more famous and more powerful class, QMA, for which we also allow this proof to be a quantum state that we send. Um, but still, we strongly believe that uh, QCMA hard problems um, cannot be solved efficiently on a quantum device. So it does give kind of some uh, complexity theoretic no-go results if we prove hardness. Um, the idea why this is the relevant class is because, okay, I don't have the picture, that these variational parameters effectively serve as a classical uh, proof for our VQA instance. So if we ask whether we can prepare a low energy state, giving us the correct angles uh, ha uh, has that role of a proof. So the main results we have is uh, in this paper, we kind of give a uh, rigorous complexity theoretic analysis, and then uh, assume one, which uh, shows a strong hardness in uh, the circuit depth. So we show that uh, even with a fixed promise, with a constant promise gap in the expectation value, um, we, uh, we get that for, uh, okay, we have to make uh, four local observables that uh, the problem is QCMA hard even if we make the uh, promise ratio with respect to the depth scale with the encoding size of the instance. So what this means that effectively no, no algorithm that, can guarantee, that has guaranteed polynomial lifetime can guarantee that it has a circuit depth which is anywhere near the optimal value. Um, these results also apply uh, hardness for other structures, such as a fixed depth or um, if we have a fixed circuit structure. And uh, later on I will also mention the QAOA instances for which we also show the same hardness result. So now how do we prove the theorem? Uh, we first need to find a QCMA uh, hard, uh, complete problem. And for this we use uh, something called QMSA, which is kind of an artificial problem. Uh, it is called quantum monotone satisfying assignment problem. And um, the basic idea is we are given a circuit description of um, uh, the description of a circuit uh, composed of two qubit gates. And uh, this um, quantum circuit acts on proof registers A and auxilla registers B. And uh, the task is to find a uh, classical bit we insert here, a classical state we insert here, uh, and then uh, uh, for which the circuit accepts. And accepting is just a fancy word for measuring one with really high probability. But not only that, we also want to minimize the Hemming weight, so the number of ones in the uh, classical proof, uh, which kind of makes our, gives us our optimization problem. And this uh, problem has been shown to be QCMA hard to approximate with respect to the Hemming weight, with also having this uh, gap ratio scale with the instance size. So uh, how do we do our proof? Well, we show this by a reduction from QMSA to uh, VQA instances. And uh, this basically means that uh, if we are given a QMSA instance, we want to find a VQA instance which gives us the exact same solution, so uh, many one reduction. Um, this means uh, two things, basically, uh, for these reductions, that if the circuit accepts for some input X, which has the correct appropriate Hemming weight, 
then there also exists a variational state with the correct depth to uh, implement a low energy state. And if the circuit never accepts, then there also does not accept a, a variational state. So we have to show both these conditions. And uh, we also have to take care that the hardness ratio actually scales the way we want it to. So how would you do the reduction? We take the, the, the registers of the QMSA instance, and then uh, crucially add another time register, which we will need for soundness. And uh, now we have a, a set of generators, P, um, which can effectively insert the classical bit string. So by choosing those uh, or not choosing them, we can insert any string here. And then uh, we have the gates Q, which um, are uh, connected to the clock register. And what they do is they increment the clock register, but when, when they are doing that, they also, uh, uh, they also implement the circuit, the QMSA circuit. So uh, we have both those generator sets. And then what the observable does is it uh, basically measures the, uh, the circuit output up here. And it also ensures that we are uh, in the last state of the clock register. Um, so why does this work? The reason is basically if we think about completeness, it means that we have to implement a, a QMS, we have to be able to implement a QMSA instance. And this means, uh, and how we do that is basically we apply P whenever the proof string is one, and then perform all other Q gates in order, which implements the uh, circuit. And this total depth now for this construction is the Hemming weight of X plus uh, the depth of the QMSA circuit. And soundness we can basically enforce through this clock uh, register construction that um, the uh, VQA can't really uh, uh, cheat in any meaningful fashion. So uh, now um, this is not enough. When we want to have the hardness result, we actually need to uh, change a few more things. And this means we have to add the register uh, D here, as well as two more generators. And the sole reason we are doing this is basically to um, make the depth of the circuit, uh, the depth of the VQA be proportional to the Hemming weight of the proof. Um, but we, we take care that all of this new construction still gives us the same scaling as the original QMSA instance, since we need this for the hardness. Uh, so what we basically do is, in the completeness now, um, in order to flip one bit here, we have to go through the uh, D register and go back again. So now implementing one one in the proof register takes uh, kind of this uh, time which scales with the size of the D register. And from this we can basically get the hardness uh, ratio because now a D and the Hemming weights are proportional to each other. So now I think I have time. Um, I will talk about a specific case, the uh, quantum alternating operator ansatz, short uh, QAOA. And um, the idea is that this is kind of a particular VQA architecture, which is inspired by the adiabatic theorem. Uh, shortly, the adiabatic theorem, I guess most are familiar, states that if we want to prepare a ground state of some target Hamiltonian uh, HC, we can start in the ground state of uh, uh, another simpler Hamiltonian HB and slowly time evolve transitioning from, the one, from one Hamiltonian to the other. And um, kind of the, the observation one can do is that if we have this transition, we can trotterize, we can discretize the time evolution and then trotterize to see that we uh, basically can prepare uh, our desired ground state by a long chain of alternatingly applying the time evolutions of those two uh, Hamiltonians. Now, um, the big problem here, of course, is uh, that uh, in general, this uh, number, the number of gates depends on the spectral gap, which is the difference between the first excited state and the ground state energy. And that gap can basically close, which means we need exponential or even more number of gates to, uh, to perform this transition. Um, now, um, the idea of QAOA is 
instead of having those zetas be like trotterized variables we calculate expli explicitly to make them uh, tunable classical parameters in a VQA framework. So we try to optimize uh, those angles and hopefully, um, of course, in the process, avoid having to run these really long trotterized sequences, but actually speed up the process and uh, uh, more uh, importantly, the circuit depth. So how do we define our instance? We uh, have this problem here. So uh, the initial state is uh, the uh, crown state of our uh, simple Hamiltonian HB, which we uh, want to be a product state just to avoid like annoyances. Um, then uh, the cost observable, which is our target Hamiltonian HC. Um, and the generators we are allowed to use are again those two Hamiltonians. Um, so the structure basically looks like this, that we can just alternatingly between, alternatingly apply these two Hamiltonian evolutions. Uh, our second theorem is basically the same as before, only now for these QAOA instances, uh, that we still have this uh, scaling promise, uh, promise ratio with uh, respect to the circuit depth. Uh, what this kind of uh, implies is that uh, while we can uh, reduce the uh, depth of adiabatic transitions by fixing these angles. The um, doing so is, however, like complexity theoretic, uh, quite a hard uh, task. So for the QAOA reduction, how do we do it? We basically start with the original construction, which is here with, with all those gates. And uh, now we have to add each generator to one of the two Hamiltonians. Effectively, when we time evolve these Hamiltonians, what happens is that uh, depending on in what state we are, we will apply either one of those two generators. Um, then, since we only can choose the angles now, we don't have this option of choosing the uh, gates anymore. We uh, uh, um, define a three cyclic behavior at certain points, which kind of um, makes the circuit decide whether to implement a one in the proof register or uh, whether to not do that. And then um, there's also uh, the problem that we need to have the correct crown state, so we need to modify our Hamiltonian again to uh, ensure that we do indeed start in the all zero state effectively. But um, yeah, also this should not uh, change the time evolution, so there's kind of these two components we have to play around with. And similarly for the observable of HC, we have the same problem that um, we want the observable to be close to our target observable from before, but um, we want uh, the time evolution to not be affected by that. And yeah, but if you make the analysis at some epsilons and deltas at some places, you can uh, yeah, show, show rigorously completeness and soundness. Good. Uh, with that, I already come to my conclusion. Um, what we've shown is uh, uh, that the optimal circuit depths of VQAs are strongly QCMA hard to approximate, so that it is, uh, in worst case, difficult to find a uh, short uh, quantum circuit, like uh, to find uh, the shortest quantum circuits for our instances. And we also showed that this is kind of uh, uh, equally true for the more restricted settings of uh, QAOAs. Um, yeah. So uh, some open questions we can of course ask is, uh, the first one is uh, one which is always relevant about average case complexity. So just because those instances exist, it doesn't mean that they are also the more the, like problematic in practice. Although there does seem to be some evidence that due to a lot of local minima and the optimization and all that, they, uh, these problems can occur quite regularly. So the better question to ask potentially is whether we can find relevant interest instances we are interested in where we can actually show that the depth optimization is an easy problem, because that would be quite interesting. And then, of course, I, only, I mentioned noise, but I only kind of used it to motivate that we want short circuits. Um, one can, of course, ask whether this um, yeah, more... Um, yeah, like a better model for the noise will change these results. Like there have been some papers proposing that uh, 
noise can actually help in certain aspects, but in principle, I mean, it can also make stuff much worse. And future work, so what we, uh, we are currently working on is we are uh, we choosing, um, like we, we are extending this work, so we went already to two generators, so now we want to look at uh, kind of this time, uh, at, as time evolution and kind of ask questions about uh, the time evolution of local Hamiltonians. And with that, I thank you for listening, and yeah. All right, uh, questions? There's one back all the way over there. Is there any others closer? Nope. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for the nice talk. Um, um, yeah, I have a question about, uh, you, you mentioned also depth complexity, but um, uh, how many parameters do you need? Um, because uh, do, do, you do you choose at each gate uh, different parameters? Um. And also the second question is uh, about uh, the entanglement complexity of your, um, did, you, did you study also the how much you need uh, an entanglement gate to for a better uh, results in the. Um, so our our model for the first question, um, our model uses uh, that we can select the generators, which is the set, so this doesn't need that much complexity, and then we have this kind of time of how long we apply the generators, which is a continuous variable. So those two are the kind of questions we would want to answer in our problem. Um, about the entanglement, I'm not quite sure what you mean. For our proof constructions, what we do is those operators are basically swap operations. So uh, we know that swap operations can, uh, can cause quite a lot of entanglement. So in that sense, one might ask the question whether if we have like low entangled or prepare low entangled state, those problems might not be that severe. I don't know if that answers your question. Okay, thanks. Hi. Um, how is your work related to the problem of overparameterization? Basically, you need uh, expansion many parameters in general to overparameterize and actually find uh, global minima in such as convergent local means. Is there a relationship? Yes. This problem? I mean, um, for once, what we are kind of showing is that uh, like overparameterization will work, but only if you have exponentially many right, mm. generators or gates effectively, right? So we have the problem that it will be exponential anyways. Mm. And what we are kind of showing here is that um, in the context where we don't have a universal gate set, so where we, where we are uh, restricted to a certain set, then we actually get a lot more problems because then we get those local minima and then we get stuck in areas. So if you, right here, the observable we have is a trivial observable, right? So the only thing that really makes this problem bad or like hard is that we don't have a universal gate set to begin with. But then again, we don't really want a universal gate set because then we are potentially significantly over uh, parameterizing. Yes. So this is kind of the issue we are also looking at. Any others? Um, if not, maybe I'll take a question. Uh, so, if I understood correctly, the no instances are guaranteed to require high depth. Right? Yeah. Um, so, have you been able to construct explicit hard QAOA instances that might be interesting in the experimental community? Mm. Or is it sort of a battle of constants that's not really a practical reduction? Um, I mean, I guess one question one can ask the other is how does the... Uh like, for QAOs, we know that they will always converge, or, I mean, as long as there's no symmetry and the adepotexium holds, that they will always converge. Um, I guess one can ask on what time scale, right? So it does not even need to be exponential. It could be potentially even smaller. So uh, the time scales could be really long. And then what we have shown is that on these time scales, I think we can find problems where it does not work. But equally, our construction, for instance, we have kind of polynomial depths, and there we have those problems as well. So it, it does kind of show that we are limited in how good we can go, irregardless of the depth. But we didn't really focus on like specific 
problems. And I mean, of course, we could try and make these Hamiltonians we define more physically motivated, which I think we can do and we are potentially thinking about, but we haven't done that yet. Any final questions? Okay, uh, let's thank our speaker once more.